and I'm recording for this morning's class too because I I pulled up the I pulled up the uh, PowerPoint and I thought it I thought it was going to be you want to get some water or some vodka or something? Sorry. Okay. Um, it didn't I didn't like the way it looked, so we're going to use some of the slides and then I'm going to jump to the whiteboard because the slides on some of this can confuse you. All right, so we're going to be doing the point estimate for the sample mean. Write that down. The point estimate for the sample mean. In the first one, we did the point estimate for the ratio or the percentage or the area. Now we're doing the point estimate for the sample mean. Okay. In other words, instead of giving you a proportion, they're going to give you five or six numbers, and you're going to find the mean, blah, 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 blah. Okay, and you're going to do a 95% confidence level, all that good stuff. Now, again, it's not difficult. We're going to have to jump to a T table instead of a Z table, or we're going to use the inverse T in your second bars instead of your inverse norm. So... A point estimate is the value of a statistic that estimates the value of a parameter. Statistic, lowercase statistic, means what? Starts with a S. Sample. Sample. And what does a parameter? Start with a P. Population. Population. So you're, the value of a sample statistic that estimates the value of a parameter. Remember me saying, if I took, if I found out how many... Uh, what's the average age of students at Anderson campus? And I find that it's 26. Well, then after I run my math through chapter 9 and chapter 10, I find out that I'm predicting with a 95% popular uh, confidence level that the average age at Tri-County Tech as a whole college is 27. Okay. I did not do any research at the main campus or the Easley campus. Or the, what, I just predicted using the Anderson campus, and that's what we're doing here. For example, the sample mean, X bar, is a point estimate of the population mean. It is a predictor for the population mean. Now, we're not going to use these numbers. We're going to use these numbers because I found a good, let me go to the whiteboard, I found a good example and think of this, they take one example like these numbers and they use it for five or six different calculations. Isn't that neat? Versus going all over the place like these, okay let's do this. I want to go to the Excel spreadsheet. Go to the Excel spreadsheet so everybody can see it. <coughs> There's 16 numbers, so N is equal to 16. And I'm just going to call this X. And here we go. Here we go. 35.7. Use your calculator if you don't have a uh, Excel spreadsheet handy in your, in your pocket. 37.2. 34.1. 38.9, 32, 41.3, uh, 32.5, 37.1, 37.3, 38.8. What's so important, Mr. Poehler? 38.2. It's not another picture, is it? Yeah. Okay. 38 point two, 39.6, 32.2, 40.9, 37, and 36. Y'all check, yeah, there's 18, 19, yeah. I'll go ahead and put that in order for you. Well, I'll let you go ahead and write them. Go ahead and write them, and you put them in order on your spreadsheet or your calculator. Oh, I need to check to make sure anybody's 
Want to Skype in. Oops. Nope. While you're at it, go ahead and find the mean, median, mode, range, mid-range, variance, and standard deviation because we're going to need it later. You go to uh, stat edit and then you put ascending order and then L1 and then enter. Ascending, you go to, hold on a second, let me pull up the calculator and I'll just show you. Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean, yeah, like I hadn't showed you. I was saying, yeah, like mm -hmm. I appreciate that because I'm like a visual learner. Uh, like, well, I've already done it like three times. When? <laughs> you not, not you, not you, her. <laughs> Go to stat. I'm going to edit and I'm just going to type in two, four, one, and seven. <laughs> or one and one, whatever. Okay, now I go to stat, ascending, sort A, which is ascending, hit enter, and type in second, one, which if you look above the one, it's L1, that's your first column. Close parenthesis, enter, and now hit stat, edit, and it should be in order. One, one, two, four. Gmail. Turn that thing on. <laughs> you are quite welcome. Thank you. No. We appreciate that. <laughs> All right, you good? Now, to hit your, your first variable statistic, you hit stat. Calculate, first variable statistic, L1, and calculate. There you go. And you need X bar and sigma. Sigma is a little O with a pompadour on top. Okay, so X bar is 2, and sigma is 1.22. Now also, while we're at it, go ahead and hit second bars and I'm just going to show you this one number four inverse T that is the coinciding function to find your T area versus your Z area Z is inverse norm you with me T is inverse T and we're going to talk about the difference between Z and T Z is a little bit more for the norm, where T is for things that are not following the normal curve, okay? A lot of quality assurance factories, of quality assurance departments and factories use T versus Z. So we're going to get to that in just a minute. So there, it's under second bars and what is it, calculate? I think it's calculate. Calculate. Yeah. Number four, okay? We'll get to that later. All right, so let's go back to the handy-dandy Excel spreadsheet that I'm trying to get to. There we go. All right, so i got to put them in order. So if you got a spreadsheet, you highlight, and you hit sort. Data, sorry, sort, there you go. Now I'm going to go over here and I'm going to find everything. Actually, you can go in and tell the computer what to find, but we're not going to do that. Mean, 
median mode range mid range variance and standard deviation. Now I realize that we've done this in unit one, but the reason I'm going over it again is because of two things. You need to know the mean. Why? Because that's X bar. And you need to know X bar because you need it in formulas. So I'm going to put mean and I'm going to put right beside it, parentheses, oops, parentheses, X bar. And then also with the mean, as I've taught you all from the first unit, what's the other second most important number? The standard deviation. Good. So with that, we're going to move ahead and go ahead and find the mean. That's the sum divided by 16. And make a note, this is 16 forward focuses. Gas mileage on 16 forward focuses. That's, so if you see it in your homework or anything, that's where it comes from. All right, so divided by 16, that's the mean. The median, since it's 16, what's half of 16? Eight. So that means nine and 10, pretty much going to be it, right? Or is it 10? Let's see. Oh, I can't use those because it's not starting with number one. That looks like it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we'll highlight this in Amarillo. Did I get it right? Sure. Amarillo, is that close sure. enough for government work? Yeah. Yep. Dang old King George. Mode, I don't care. Range equals to the highest minus the lowest. The lowest. And the mid-range is equal to the highest plus the lowest divided by two. And the variance equals X minus X bar F4. Copy. And square that. Of course, all this should be second nature. You should be, I uh, know how to do that. Sum. Enter variance is equal to that number divided by 15. And 15 is going to come up again as degrees of freedom. Write down N is equal to 16. Degrees of freedom. D O F is equal to 15. Write that down. And this is raised to the 0.5 power. And those are your two important. Now, what did we get on our handy-dandy calculator? I can't remember, so we'll hit it again. So second, our stat, calculate, first variable statistic, L1, calculate. There we go. Oh, I didn't have it in there, but y'all check it. What'd y'all get? 36.8 for the mean. Okay. Hmm. Check it and see if there's a 2.9. It might be SX. It's SX. Look at the SX. SX. It's not sigma. It's SX. Remember sex. Oh my God. I said sex. Okay. Remember SX. That's your standard deviation. So when you go into your, when you go into your uh, right here, there it is. SX. Read the SX, not the, not the sigma. I messed up there. All right. So, everybody remember that? Everybody good? All right. Now, after we do that, you can do it on your calculator. Let me see what else I did here. I'm going by my notes here. Okay, that's in the slides. So, let me go back to the slides. And the slides will tell you, and I'm going to write on this. Slide. There we go. And I'm going to skip that. Go ahead and write down that one. That is your T distribution formula. 
Now, if you notice, it looks like your Z formula back in 8.1, doesn't it? Your Z formula in 8.1 and 8.2 look like X minus X bar over the standard deviation divided by the square root of N. Remember? And look at it. They look very similar. But this is what we're going to use now. And it will show you in this, the Z score looks like this. I meant the Z distribution looks something like this. 0, 1, 2, 3, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. Where the T distribution looks like this. Okay, what's the difference? The difference is that the T distribution is more spread out. The symmetrics are still the same. You still got the bell-shaped curve, but why would you use the T? Well, maybe you've got more than 30 samples, or maybe you've got 1,000 or 1,200 or whatever the case may be. The whole point is <clears throat> it's used for whenever it is spread out further, okay? That's usually when the T is used. And the T is also going to be used when you're dealing with the um, estimating the what? Mean. Actually, it was, you ever heard of Guinness beer? Okay, there was a guy that was, that was all big in the, in the, founding and whatever, origination of Guinness beer, and his name was Gossett, G-O-S-S-E-T-T. -T. I remember my, my uh, Clemson professors telling me this story. And he was kind of like the first quality assurance department head and back in those days. And he was trying to figure out why he would pull five beers and check them, and then he would pull another five beers and check them, and another five beers, and he'd do it 10 or 15 times a day, and he couldn't get the normal curve. He couldn't get it right. And the reason is he was using big groups of samples. He was doing that like every day for like 365 around the, you know. So it was a huge, huge group of random, simple random samples, which mean groups of five. Groups of five beers here, groups of five beers here, and he'd do that every day for 365 days. So he had to use something else, and he came up with the help of some, some academic guru from over there, I can't remember who that was, and they came up with the T distribution. So you could say that the T distribution came from Guinness Beer. That's where it came from, okay? Um, I don't know if you really want to know that, but I told it to you anyway. All right. Yeah. Somebody would complain. And there is the two. I've already, I've already done that. So there's the two. Uh, and they give you the histograms. And this is where I got into the slides, and I'm like, you know, really? I don't think this is very important. And you see that the Z is more cramped up. You see that? But look at... You look at T, T is more spread out. spread out. And the reason it's better for be spread out is because you would use this for Michelin, for pulling the tires. You would use the T distribution versus the Z distribution. For your grades or for class grades, you would use the Z distribution. You see what I'm saying? It all depends on the quantity because the quantity is going to spread it out more. So you got to have a T distribution. you got to have a distribution mechanism to do the spread out versus the condensed. And that's why we use the T. That's the best way I can explain it, okay? Um, so that takes care of that. Takes care of that. Okay, here's an example. We're gonna kind of get off the beaten path here. 
I'm going to come back to this. Keep. And the reason I'm going back and forth is because this is one of the sections that really confuses students. So that's why I'm going back and forth, because I don't want you to be confused. Well, some of y'all, I don't want you to be confused. Some of y'all really don't care. I really don't like you anyway. So. I, I didn't say any names. Okay. Find the T value, area to the right, equaling 0 0.1000. 0 0. Notice that I'm giving you four digits. What does four digits mean? Area. Thank you. You're the one. Listen. Okay? That's an area. And it's to the what? Right. To the right. So if I drew a picture for that one person that's actually drawn the picture like I told you to, you're talking about, let's take a blue marker. And this area is point one zero zero zero. That's what they're asking for. Now throw Z out the window because remember Z you're not using anymore. This is mean, so you're using T. All right? And we're using 15 degrees of freedom. And we'll go back to black. 15 degrees of freedom. Remember DOF. DOF is degrees of freedom. And it's written like that, okay? <laughs> And usually it's written little d, little o, little f. Now you go to the table. Those of you that have a book, go find your table. And there's a t table. Okay? And you just need to find a point one. Now this is a right-hand side. This is one tail. You don't have two tails. Two tails, you have one over here and one over here. It's two tails. One tail, two tails. And then you would look at an area for point one along the row of 15. Okay, so look down the side of your degrees of freedom, those that have a table. If you don't have a table, then just don't try to, don't try to do anything, okay? So you yeah, got look for the T table. Okay? Let me see. I don't know what it looks like. Let me turn the light on back here so I can sleep. Yes. So you're going to look at, yeah, you already got 1.341. You're so smart. And it's under point 10. So point 10, point 1000, and then look on the left-hand side for 15 degrees of freedom and cross that. And it should come up with what? 1.3 what? 1.341. 1.341. So that is the T score. T is equal to 1.341. Now you know your T score to put into your formulas. So you use it just like you do the Z score, only you have to look at a different table. Now what if you don't have a table? Then you pull out your handy dandy calculator. So we pull it out, second bars, inverse T. And fill in, fill in the blanks. I'm going to pull up the calculator. So let me pull up the calculator. Second, bars, inverse T, area. Hmm. What do you reckon what area is? One, zero, zero, zero. Now, I don't have to type in three zeros. The reason I do that is to try to get across to you that four digits means area. I've been saying that now for what, two chapters? DF. That means depth. What does it mean? Fifteen. I just want to make sure you all paying attention. And enter. It's a miracle. 1.341.
Now, as I told you, most of the time we're going to be doing what? And this thing, now you can do it another way. We are looking, This the, ca the calculator does from the left. Everybody with me? Just like the table. So I need to redo it, and it's, if I don't like that negative, which you just take the absolute value like we did the z-score, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to type in instead of point 0.1, <laughs> what's the complement of point 0.1? Point Good job. I'm... I'm, I think I just need to quit right now. 1.341. So you can do it either way. Do it with 0.10 and take the absolute value. Or do it with 0.9, which is the complement, the left-hand side, because the calculator on the inverse T is reading from the, as well as the inverse norm, is reading from the left. So that's why I typed in 0.9. You do however you want. Capiche? Now that's how you find what? That's how you find your T-score. All right, now we're going to find a confidence interval. This is how we were doing the other day, so don't, don't. Don't act like you're lost or anything. You're going to set it up. What is a confidence interval? That's where instead of P hat, it's going to be not, not P hat, but what are we doing? The mean, which is mu, is going to be between some number and some number. This is called the confidence what? Interval. interval. Confidence interval. So... I want you to construct, this is with the forward focus data. I want you to construct a 95% confidence interval for the mean MPG of that data. That's the way the question will be worded. Okay? For the forward focus data, the directions will say construct a 95% confidence interval for the mean miles per gallon. So, X bar plus or minus T S square root of N. So crank it out. You already got all the numbers. You got your X bar. You got your S. Okay, we've we got to do one thing. I forgot to tell you. 95% confidence level. We've got to find T sub alpha over 2. So 95% alpha is equal to 0.05. What's alpha over 2? 0 0.025. So somebody pull up the... Uh, T score for 0 0.0250. So go ahead and do that and find the absolute value. What'd you get? 
I'm waiting. Did you get 2.131? Okay, thank you, one person. Everybody should be saying, yeah, that's what I got. Now, finish cranking it out. Why do I have 36.8? That's not right, because the square root of... Square root of 16 is 4, isn't it? Is the stuff that we did with the 36, that's all the same problem? Yes. Yeah, that's why I wrote from the forward focus data. And a T? Forward focus data. What? The T value that we counted. I just told you what to find the T value right here. T sub 0 0.0250 is equal to, you're going to type in inverse T, and you're going to do, you don't, you don't have to do, it's going to give you the left hand side, so that's going to be negative. So what is 0 0.9750? So T sub 0 0.9750. Somebody, either one of those, what does it come out to be? Should be 2.131. I should have everybody saying that, but I've... I've Okay, two people have got it. Okay, thank you out of 19. I appreciate the interaction. Now plug and chug. And what is in? 16? Yes, Hubert, N is 16. So what's the square root of 16? Four. So you're going to get 36. 36.8 plus or minus 2.131 times the standard deviation is 0.2.92. Y'all yep. check me. Yeah. Over the square root of 16, which is going to be. 36.8 plus or minus 2.131. Somebody take 2.92 and divide by 4. 0. 0.73. 0. what? 0. And now work that out. Don't, don't just do the 2.131 times 7.73. 36.8 plus or minus, what is 0.73 times 2 1.51? 1.51 times 0.73. 1.56, good enough. Now, somebody tell me what this is. If I'm taking the mean and I'm adding on the right and subtracting on the left, what is this? It's the interval. The mode, the margin of error. So your margin of error is 1.56%. Now, now you can do your adding and subtracting. I'm going to put this in green because this is your answer. Mu is between what two numbers? 36.8 minus 
36.8 plus 1.56. I got 35.24. And 38.36, check me. Yeah. Now it's very important that you write down the next sentence because this is the whole point of doing this. You don't have to write everything I'm going to say. Just hold on a second, I'll tell you what to write. What was our mean for the sample? Okay, now this is what you need to write down. Use it. A mean, a sample mean of, I'll oh, just forget it, I better write this down. <laughs> Using a sample mean of 36.8 miles per gallon, I can say with a 90 what? 95% confidence level that all, what does all mean? That any forward focus put out in 2000, I think this was 2012, okay? That any forward focus put out will be, the gas mileage will be between 35 and what? 38 miles per gallon. Now uh, you could add the you can add the uh, decimals if you want to. I'm just the sentence is more important than the answer almost because you got to understand what you're actually doing. You're taking a sample mean and you are what predicting for all the forward focuses. Now some of you may say, well, that's fine. Well. You can see where this can be used. I mean, you could use this in all kinds of different applications. Miles per gallon with a car is a good example. Okay? I wish I had somebody in here that has a Ford Focus. I do. Okay? What do you get for miles per gallon? I don't know. I knew that was going to be the answer. I knew it. All I know is it takes $20. It takes what? $20. $20. I'm not even going to ask how do you find the miles per gallon. I'm not even going to ask that. Don't tell us. No. No, I'm not going to ask. What you do, you can, now you, most of the time they have a little thing that tells you. Yeah. I think that's the same But what I'm saying is on the on the dashboard, you usually have a little, a little place that has miles per gallon and it computes it with the computer. That's why I don't know how to do it. Huh? That's why I don't know how to do it. Well, what you do... Is you fill up your tank. You with me? All right. You fill up your tank and you write down the mileage when you fill up your tank. Then you ride it around town, whatever. If, you, if, if you're going on a trip, best do it on a trip because you get your highway miles. But if you do it around town, you got to do it two different times. Town and how trip. But if you do it around town, you, you run about half get half the tank out. Then you write down the mileage that you have and you subtract to get the mileage between Phillips and you fill it back up, find out how many gallons it took to fill it up, you watch the thing, and then you divide the gallons into the miles. That's how you do it. Now the computer does that and it's pretty efficient because the computer is based off of the, the gas tank. The gas tanks now, they read digitally pretty much and it can tell how much you're getting when you stomp it, when you're in the city, and then it'll level out when you're on the highway. But anyway, if you've got a Ford Focus, if you figure it, it I, we're using this data from 2012, I guarantee you're going to be between 35 and 38 miles per gallon if it's a 2012. Because this actually comes from fueleconomy.com. This is an actual survey that was done, a study that was done. Okay. Hold on. Let me check to make sure you all not going into convulsions or anything. Okay, I got a few more minutes because I got to cover one more thing, and that is the sample size. Okay, the sample size we did it at the end of of nine point one, so we're going to do it here, same way. In fact, you don't use the t value, you use the z value, so it's not any different. 
I just can't work the computer right now. There we go. All right, so this is what the question is going to say. It's going to say, how large of a sample, how large of a sample is required to estimate miles per gallon within 0.5 miles per gallon. So that's actually your margin of error right there. Why does it say margin of error? Because what's this word? Within. When you see within, that means they're giving you margin of error. With a 95 percent confidence level. So you want to go out and do the on the bow tie. So you want to find out how many what is that thing called? Chevrolet Silverado or whatever. <laughs> okay. You want to, you got to go out and do this. What year is it? 2000. 2000. So you go you do 2000. You got to find out how many 2000 trucks Whatever that is, you got to find out how many will give you within 0.5 miles per gallon and a 95% confidence level. So how many you got to do? Well, we take our handy dandy. Somebody find out the Z score at 0.95, which means 0 0.05 divided by two, which is equal to. You should have an index card. 0 0.0250. And I got 1.96. So there's your Z score. And we're going to plug it in. Plug it into your regular. I didn't even write it down. Oh, well. Z times what? 2.92. That's the standard deviation. Divided by the margin of error and square. So that's going to be 1.96 divided by 2.92 divided by 0.5 squared and I get 131.02 which rounds up to what? 132 vehicles. So, of course, I would probably, if I was doing it for an employer, I would do 150. Okay? But that's what you do. That's, that's how you do it. And remember, N is equal to this. And that's from 8 point, I mean 9 point, 9.1 and 9.2. Okay? Now, my suggestion to y'all tonight I mean, not tonight, but this weekend, is to make sure you do or try to do at least two or three problems out of, uh, try to do two problems with the P hat, try to do two problems with the N in 9.1, then try to do two problems with the, the, the standard coming the uh, mean in 9.2, and try to do two problems with the N in 9.2. That's a minimum of four problems. You need to try to do that over the weekend. Four problems out of 9.1 9 and four problems out of 9.2. And the reason you need to do that is because we're probably, look in your outline, going to start with 10, which is the null hypothesis. The null and alternative hypothesis. Okay? All right, y'all get out of here and have a good weekend. And work on 9.1 and 9.2. I'm sorry, I'm off the clock. I'm sorry. No, what? I, yeah, 9.1 and 9.2. I want you.